is always, always challenging us to look more deeply. And so a lecture like this, if we can look more deeply into the films, into the plays that we see, into maybe the music that we listen to, we maybe we'll start looking more deeply into each other, which is ultimately the greatest gift we can give to someone we really care about. Because in this world, we're so easily distracted by so much technology, by so much, that when we really focus on what's in the room with us or in our life, it becomes something that you go, oh my God, how fragile, how special, how fleeting this moment is. And I better, you know, take it all in with undivided attention. So, with that said, all right, we're going to try to get to the first clip here. And... That's in the right line. Oh, see, they actually, the lineup changed accidentally when they were with the computer. All right. Uh, okay, let me... Okay. Citizen Kane, 1941. What makes this film obviously important is that whether you like it or not, I guess I have to say the light, it is ranked number one year after year decade after decade, as the greatest film ever made. What is astonishing is the person who made it, Orson Welles, was actually 25 when the film was complete. He had never directed a movie, he had never starred in a movie, feature film, he had never co-written a screenplay, he had never edited a, you know, a feature-length film, and he certainly hadn't produced one. So how could someone with this kind of, well, lack of experience make a movie that is this lasting? that hasn't been, well, superannuated by so many other great filmmakers that obviously have their sights on being number one. Whether they're Hitchcock, whether they're Kubrick, whether they're uh, Del Toro, they can be after that top spot, but they never seem to be able to unseat this particular individual who made this movie. Now, I'm gonna show you one clip from this film. Uh, I hope. Now. Citizen Kane is unusual for its time because there were very few films that used flashback. Wuthering Heights had a few. Citizen Kane is just flashbacks within flashbacks within flashbacks. Five different narrators, all unreliable. This is something that was revolutionary. There's overlapping dialogue in this film, which was something that was, again, against tradition. People waited, actors, until the other character finished his or her line, then they came in. He was overlapping dialogue, 30-some years before Robert Altman, who made a career of overlapping dialogue, and he was able to do it because there were eight-track recording systems invented in the 1970s. Here's a guy with crude technology that's being able to pull this off. <coughs> what we're going to see is a scene that if, let's say, of a filmmaker, only this footage survived. This is it. You would know that he was one of the greatest filmmakers of, of his or any generation. And so, as we see his friend, Jedediah Leland, recount Charles Foster Kane's marriage, we have what was called the breakfast montage. Look at the way that table just gets longer and longer and longer. As the distance of this relationship grows further and further apart, the two characters emotionally. Michelangelo Antonioni, famous Italian filmmaker, La Notte, uh, La Ventura, uh, you know, he made uh, Blow Up, one of my favorites. He said that with the cinemascope screen, the widescreen, he was able to suggest psychological distances between characters in the way that they were spatially related to one another within the frame. So therefore, up close and personal, far away. But in this era, the screen wasn't that wide. It was a 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio. Cinemascope is 2.35. It's almost 2.5 to 1. So they had the room. Once the mid-1950s came out, the cinemascope was introduced. Somehow, he's able to give you a cinemascope sense, right, in a medium on a, a format that was very intimate, obviously. So, what is important to know is how his own personal life came into this movie. His father was an alcoholic. His mother died when he was still a child. His father will pass away when he's a teenager. He'll be taken in by Dr. Maurice Bernstein in Chicago who will actually be the father that he never really had, because he was like the father to his father. His alcoholic father was in really bad shape. In this movie, he is a pretty bad guy. You know, he's a, you know, 
huge ego, it's all about him. You can be critical, critical of him in so many levels. But see, in that sequence, in that moment, when he talks about, well, that present that my friend, my business partner, gave to our son, she calls it an atrocity. The reason she doesn't want it in the nursery is because obviously Bernstein is Jewish. And that's something that an atrocity, 1941, when this movie came out, well, World War II, the Nazi concentration camps, this was actually happening. But the fact that there is only one character in this movie, Bernstein, who actually is positively portrayed, that is Orson Welles, right, paying homage to the man who raised him. Okay, thank you. 1960, that's 19 years later, the Citizen Kane number one, here's a man who was born in 1899, Alfred Hitchcock. Being 60, 61, in 1960, is like being over 90 today. Today, 90 is the new 60. But back then, you were like ancient. He should be retiring to the fat farm with his millions. He made a lot of great movies in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Hey, retire, go to film festivals, let people genuflect at, their altar, at your altar. But no. With this film, he said, I am going to, quote, boldly signal a new era in filmmaking. That's pretty, uh, well, outrageous talk from an old fat man. But guess what? <laughs> he delivers. This film is, I think, his greatest, and he has many great films. From the opening sequence that is so riveting, you know, the score by Bernard Herrmann, where the names are only joined for momentarily before they're violently ripped apart, suggests from the outset that this movie, at least on a fundamental level, is about a quest for wholeness, a sense of completeness. But see, people, we are fragmented. That's the problem. And we are, well, it is violent how we are ripped apart as individuals in the course of this narrative. Yeah, he doesn't declare the money. He gets to keep it because he steals the money. <coughs> right? He's a rich guy. The irony here is that she was in the previous scene with her boyfriend who actually professed to her that I can't afford to marry you, Marion, even though that's her name, Marion. She wants to be married. She's clearly over 30. Her biological clock is ticking, 1960. It was like a big bend for a woman if you were over 30 and you wanted to have a kid. And here was the guy that she's invested all this time with who says to her, I can't afford, I can't afford us to get together and make it permanent. She comes back to the office and this old guy sits down on her desk. Back in the day, that was called business as usual. Today, it would be sexual harassment. There'd be a lawsuit. <laughs> they just off the suit and the 40,000 is put in front of her. But he actually plops it down saying, my baby's getting married. This is a honeymoon dream cottage. Then he reveals that the money, when she says, I declare, he says, I don't. I don't declare it on my taxes, right? That's how I get to keep it. Well, guess what? She's going to steal stolen money that's already stolen that actually really represents the honeymoon dream cottage that her boyfriend cannot afford, well, to get for them. So now, do you remember those paintings that were on the wall? Of course you don't, because you're looking at the characters. You're looking at the actresses talking to each other. But they're very important. The first one, well, is the one over her desk that looks, well, to be like a vast wasteland, a desert. She wants to have a child, but guess what? If she doesn't have it, have it soon, she's going to be barren. But actually, what we don't realize is the clock, which is ticking for me, is ticking for her. <laughs> Death is what a desert really symbolizes. So, what is that other painting that's over the desk that's unoccupied as she leaves? Well, that one is a tree-lined lake. And already we'll see that her shadow is sinking beneath the surface of that lake, which is where she's going to end up once she is dispatched from the Bates Motel in the trunk of the car, and Norman sinks that car because he doesn't want his mother who murdered her. I don't know, spoiler alert, there's going to be something that's going to happen. All right. now, interesting in that the desert is the only desert image. All the other paintings in the office are either farms or fields or lakes or... You know, forests, life, hers is, and as I said, her, there's her. So she goes home, right? Talk about foreshadowing. She was in white underwear and a white dress earlier. 
If you actually were upset that she was actually having sex with a man out of wedlock, guess what? In 1960, Hitchcock was saying, that's your problem. That was you making that judgment. And he knows that audiences love to rush to judgment. He actually made a whole career on the fact that we rush to judgment. Here he is making a movie in 1960 called Psycho. Like, really? Who would want to see that? What does that say about us? I want to go see Psycho. Uh, maybe I can pick up the pointers. Uh, now, I don't know. But you see, this movie becomes an investigation into the dark impulse that sends viewers to a movie like this one in the first place. This is a movie that totally dissects viewer expectation. Another movie that would be its twin came years later, was directed by Stanley Kubrick, and that would be The Shining, that is attempting to do a very similar thing to the audience. Totally anticlimactic throughout. That movie's like an anti-horror film, and it frustrates the viewer. But anyway, she surrenders her white underwear for black underwear. Her darker side is taking over. But what are we seeing? Well, she said she was going to the bank with the money, because there was $40,000 put down in cash that Boston wanted in the vault over the weekend. He wanted to take it to the bank. His name was Lowry, it rhymed with dowry, he was almost take it, like your surrogate father, take it, you know, go get married. And what does she do? Well, she hasn't taken it to the bank. And I'm thinking, well, maybe she just went home because she had a headache and she got some aspirin, and now what she's going to do is she's going to rest for a while and then she's going to go to the bank. No, she's not going to go to the bank. <laughs> so without a voiceover, without any dialogue, Hitchcock so beautifully has that camera pulled back to reveal the money lying on the bed, with, which is associated with the incredible sex she's going to have in the black underwear when she gets to her boyfriend, you know, her sexiest underwear, lying on the bed, because now they can be free, they can be together. And so she's running. And Hitchcock isn't through foreshadowing her future. This is a doomed love story. And there it is, right? Looming ominously over her head, the shower head. Which is not the Bates Motel, but it might as well be because the basement hotel room looks similar to this room. So, what does that picture look like? Well, she drives her boyfriend unbeknownst to him, and it looks like, well, looks like she's drove, driven right into that picture that was above her desk. She so get her deeper and deeper into that death scene. She has a cop that comes up to her. You're very kind, she says. He's making her dinner because it's rainy and it's too late to go out somewhere. Um, all those birds of prey. He actually looks like a bird. There are scenes in this movie where he absolutely is the personification of a bird of prey, dressed in black, there's the camera under him at one point. But what I love is that he says, right, offices are too officious. Let's eat in the parlor. It's more comfortable. They're in the parlor now. Well, guess what? Officious does not mean office-like, office which is how he's trying to use it. Let me be very pacific with you. Did you ever study the Spanish imposition or go to a Catholic ceremony where the priest sprinkles incest all over everybody? Okay, what am I doing? Well, it was a play written in 1775 by Richard Sheridan. It's called The Rivals. And in The Rivals, there was a character named Mrs. Malaprop. And Mrs. Malaprop kind of said words that sounded like the words she meant, but they had whole different meanings. She'd say things like, we have to be concerned about contagious nations. She means contiguous nations, I guess, that will come across the border. She would say, let me be pacific with you, instead of pacific. She would say imposition, instead of inquisition. She would say incest, or someone like that, who is a malaprop, who, you, who you know, uses malapropisms, will say uh, incest instead of incense. So what is weird is that the word officious means meddlesome and cloying. And if there's one adjective to describe his mother, and actually all the references in this movie, because there are other mothers referenced, her mother's referenced, uh, Hitchcock's daughter, who's the office mate, her mother's referenced, they would all be labeled officious, cloying, meddlesome. So we get to, they have this parlor scene. She goes back. But the movie weirdly stays with Norman. We've been following her. She's our main character. She's our chief protagonist. What are we staying with him? Takes down a painting. The painting's not just any painting. The painting is the, well, it's called, I don't know if you, oh, you do see it. It's called Susanna and the Elders. On the wall is also the Rape of the Sabine Moon. 
And when you see this, this is a perception shift. You're like, oh my gosh, Norman, he's a peeping Tom. I, have no, I had no idea. You should be violating her privacy, Norman. Norman, put that painter back. Norman, Norman, I'm telling you, you shouldn't be looking in there. Uh-oh. See, now we're like, uh, we suddenly jettison that admonishment. Notice how there are paintings of birds on the wall beside her. Her last name is Marion Crane. She's a bird, too. She left Phoenix, Arizona, which is a bird. What kind of bird is the phoenix? It's one that rises from its own ashes. So Mother will be dead, but somehow Norman, with his second self, will resurrect her. Everybody seems to come back. Everything comes back in one form or another. The cop at one point that you saw talking to her, he's going to come back later, circle around when she's trying in the middle of a, well, used car transaction. She's trying to get rid of her car because she was worried that the cop might have gotten her license plate. And now there he is across the street looking at her. The suspense, I mean, he's not the master of suspense for nothing. But when Norman actually, well, mother kills her, and Norman comes down to see the carnage mother perpetrated against this young woman, he turns, he's so appalled, he knocks that one painting, or that one drawing of the bird off the wall. He knocked her off, but we think mom did. But for right now, we're in this moment. And he's actually watching her undress. And the viewer is very titillating. But he cuts back to Norman watching her. And see, now we're thinking a whole different thing. We're watching him watching her. Before, we had no choice. Hitchcock just had us suddenly looking through that peephole. He uses 50 millimeter lenses to closely duplicate a human sight line. So it's as if the viewer is like looking through that peephole. But the first time it happened, it was just like a pleasant surprise. It made me jettison again. My you know, admonishment and concern for him and violating her privacy. Now I don't care. She's so beautiful, I want to see it. But then he denies it's that image, Hitchcock. So now I have to make a decision. See, this is what Hitchcock is great about. Making the audience make a decision. And the decision is, I want to be back inside his point of view. I want to see what, what he's seen. I want to see the rest of, oh, and guess what? He saw it all, and I missed it. <laughs> right? So, why this is important, right, is that, well, Hitchcock now has you upset, has you frustrated. And in that moment that you actually are frustrated, if you step back, you don't know it yet, but you actually want it to be inside the mindset, the point of view of a serial killer. If he had gone to a mirror right after this moment, and looked in the mirror, the audience's face would be Norman's face. We would have, we would be his double. So the ultimate double, and the reason why Norman is not photographed with mirrors, even though everybody else is, is because the ultimate double of Norman is the audience. Because we are like him in many ways. We're, you know, the movie's not saying that we're serial killers. But we are very good at repressing certain trauma and thinking it will never come back to haunt us, like the phoenix. But when you repress things and don't deal with them in an emotionally mature way, guess what? They will come back like gangbusters. So, this is the famous sequence, right? She goes into the shower. Suzanne and the Elder was a, was a story, and the Elder's story about a young woman. Look how angry he looks. About a young woman who's actually, a young maiden, who is, well, her privacy is violated by these voyeurs, these older men that actually spy on her while she's bathing. All right? So now, this sequence, the shower scene, 78 camera setups in 45 seconds. The average film at the time would have 600 setups throughout the whole film. He has 78 in 45 seconds. Another way to look at, you know, greatness, uh, Sam Peckinpah with the Wild Bunch, had over 3,600 camera setups in the wild bunch. But to get those 3,600 to be the ones, I think how many they had to shoot that were on the editing room floor. Certain directors, they are the most ambitious. They will go to whatever length it takes to actually make this story come to life in a way that is so indelible, and this scene is so indelible. No one who has seen this scene. Is there anybody who's never seen this moment? Okay, so you're all very well schooled in Hitchcock and great films, but... <laughs> there might be somebody out there. Those of us that have seen it, if we, let's say, in America, you're going to spend the night while you're driving in some lonely motel in West Virginia. You know what you do? You find a good stick or a cane or an umbrella, and you go into the room and you go under the bed. You go behind the curtains. 
You go anywhere because in the middle of your shower, you don't want some cross-dressing serial killer surprising you. And yeah, so here she is. <coughs> and what is she doing? Well, she's taking a shower, but it's more than a shower. Because she actually signed in under an alias, Marie Samuels, that's her boyfriend's name, Sam Loomis. Her name is Marion Crane. She said she was from Los Angeles, she's really from Phoenix. But by the end of that conversation with Norman, she says, you know, I realized I made a mistake back where I came from, and I'm going to go back and try to make it right. So she's going to go back to Phoenix, and he says, what was your name, or whatever, Crane, Marion Crane. She gives her a real name, she says she's going back to Phoenix in the morning. That's maybe one of the reasons why he seems so upset, she lied to him. Right? When she signed in. But, in this moment, she's doing the right thing. She's going to be washing away her iniquity. Cleansing herself from her sin. This is her moment of grace. We're one third of the way through the movie. In the history of cinema, we have never, well we rarely ever lose the chief protagonist in a film. They only die on those rare movies, usually cowboy westerns, when they got a couple arrows through them. And you know... They got the dynamite, they know they're not going to make it, so the Indians are coming, so they kind of light the fuse, and as the Indians get closer, they, he blows himself up and blows up the entire pass, so the Indians can't get to the young lovers that are now riding away into the sunset. Okay, so if they die heroically so that others may live, that's okay. Somebody dying one third of the way into the movie, and dying in this way, audience Audiences had never encountered anything like this before. This was beyond traumatic. People fainted during this movie. They had to be carried out on stretchers from this film in 1960. So she's washing and wearing iniquity, cleansing herself from her sin, and in this moment of grace is when Hitchcock chooses to have her so brutally, so violently murdered. So violently and murdered. I know you, some of, the men, some of the men can't take this lady, so I'm going to cut to the end of this. You know, sort of, I'd be remiss not to remind you of the great cinematography that is actually being deployed throughout this film as well. The editing, the music, everything. But the subtext, of course, is what then drives it all. And so here we are. A film like this is something that wherever you're somewhere alone, in a lonely place, you actually think of it. Every time you go to the beach, right? and you start stepping into that ocean. You just hope it's not a day where they could have been inspired to make Jaws here, right? <laughs> so, uh, right. So there she is. Because it's a great scene, there are going to be people out there, they're going to go after her. And, well, when they do, this is what it looks like. What's so important about a lousy, crummy newspaper? are more frightening than a middle-aged, hairy Jewish man lathering it up in the shower. 
two more scenes? Is that okay? And then we're going to go on to the Godfather films. All right. So he puts her body in the trunk. He's cleaning up after mother. Hitchcock, throughout this film, there are long sequences that are actually silent. He came out of the silent era. He knows that the image is what drives the cinema. Dialogue is along for the ride. And here's what happens. This is why he's Hitchcock and everybody else is just a regular filmmaker. As his car is sinking, we're watching it sink. Norman wants it to sink. Guess what? We don't realize how much we also want it to sink until this happens. <laughs> and once it stops, the audience has to make a decision. Do you want to see it sink or do you want to see it stay up there and Norman's going to get in trouble? He's just trying to cover up after mom. He's a dutiful son. I don't want to see him getting punished for what that crazy mother did. We all want to see this car sink. We want to see it sink, not just for that reason, but because the entire murder of her being actually killed with a bread knife, really sharp, fresh bread, that's in the script, <laughs> constantly penetrated by that bread knife. What makes that scene so disturbing? In fact, Janet Lee claims she never took a shower ever again, and she was actually in the movie. I mean, they were making <laughs> filming, but she was so upset her, she took baths for the rest of her career, but, her life, but the scene is a rape scene. It's a total violation scene. And so, because it is so sexually charged, because Norman is so sexually repressed, that he wishes he could actually, well, make love to her in a conventional manner, but he's too repressed, he's too guilty with the mother trip that he has imposed upon him, either by her or by himself, from the grave, on his own, we don't know, whatever it is, this is how he makes love to a woman. So that rape scene, we want to see it sink. We want to see it sink. Our telekinetic power now joins with Norman's. And we get what we want. And once it goes beneath the surface, it's almost like it never happened. I can almost pretend like it never happened. And Hitchcock was already preparing me to actually not be following Marion anymore. I thought she was the main character. In retrospect, she was just an elaborate introduction to the main character. He's the main character. This is his story. He just took, take, took over the narrative. Two different storylines were battling for dominance. The dominant storyline annihilates that other one in its tracks and takes over. Well, what is the whole premise of this movie? Two battling personalities in one entity, in one skull, in one person, battling for dominance. And in the end, the mother personality is going to take over. So this is a movie where its actual architecture of its story structure actually reinforces its central theme of a disparate, of a divided self. It's a divided narrative. It's a fragmented narrative, fractured narrative. All right, so. Well, that's the lake, right, where, where, where she now is underneath. His signature, or his initials were on the killing, we think mom did it, but the car that she traded in, NFB, Norman Francis Bate, there it is. And, um, sorry. You know, there's a guy that's going to come looking for her, blah, 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 I want to get you to the what? final scene. Listen. And there he is, our mirror image at the end of the movie, <laughs> staring back at us very rarely in a film. 
does the character stare right into the eyes of the viewer, but it's as if his face is my face. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have a skull of the mother superimposed in it, over it. He intended to tell them I killed those girls and that man, as if I could do anything except just sit and stare. <laughs> And that, like the phoenix, which you never wanted to see again, comes back at the end of the movie. Everything comes back. Guess what? This serial killer's been stopped. But whatever that impulse is, it makes serial killers become serial killers. And we can't explain it. That psychiatrist at the end gets it all wrong. He said, this isn't about sex. This whole movie's been about sex. So he actually misdiagnoses the actual, well, medical, you know, verdict on what was going on here. Everybody's in denial. He just said, you know, he loved his mother too much. I, well, that's good to know. Because, you know, the rest of us in this room, thank God, with our mothers, we loved her just the right amount. <laughs> you might be serial killers too. That's not any kind of explanation. You can't explain this. But guess what? Whatever it is that makes a serial killer become a serial killer, this movie is saying, guess what? It's going to be back. It'll be Jeffrey Dahmer, it'll be Joel Rifkin, it'll be the BTK killer, the Hillside Strangler, the Boston Strangler, you name it. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, yeah. Ted Bundy? All right. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can get to... The Greatness of the Godfather. That if we were going to actually have a bookshelf for the greatest films ever made, let's say this is that bookshelf, but it would be not that big, really. <laughs> the top shelf on one bookend would be Citizen Kane. And on this bookend, holding up the entire shelf of all the greatest movies that were ever made, would be The Godfather 1 and 2. Not 3, forget 3, <laughs> but 1 and 2. 1 is a great, great movie, and 2 is even better. It's not only the greatest sequel ever made. People say, God, Father, the greatest sequel ever made. It's the greatest sequel because it's also simultaneously a prequel. It's a prequel and a sequel. It's the young Vito Corleone and actually the continuation of Michael's downfall, the son of Vito Corleone. You want to compare these two movies. It's always great to compare some contrasts because actually Godfather 2 is a direct rewrite of one. It's the same scene, virtually, but with very important minor adjustments that actually enable the Corleone Empire to succeed further. We have the feds outside at the wedding, Connie's wedding, the daughter of Vito, and the feds come to get the license plate numbers of all the mafiosi, right? They're going to try to track them down. not good for business. So number two is going to make an adjustment. I love it. You have the cop now on his day off or whatever on the payroll. They're now not taking down the license plates. They're actually protecting the cars. They're on your side now. They're paid to look the other way. You get them, you know, a little sandwich, some champagne, a little, a little kickback. That's how you succeed. Okay. <laughs> Mafiosis don't like their picture take. It's not good to have current pictures. They could be identified in the lineup somewhere, all right? Now, Michael's son's Holy Communion out in Lake Tahoe, they realize that actually, you know what? It's good to get your picture taken. If you get it taken with the right people, like a congressman or a senator, and when you're giving like a big check to a charity, everybody goes, oh, what a good guy. Illegitimate funds are actually now funding this charity. What else is new? The Godfathers are monumental works, right? 
and that they actually are a critique, not of the Mafia, but actually of America. That American business operates like the Mafia. Ford Motor Company had a Pinto that they designed. The gas tank would explode if it was rear-ended, it wasn't put in the right place. Guess what? They had internal memos saying that was an acceptable number of deaths because they actually calculated how many would die from rear-end collision explosions. That was an acceptable number of deaths that didn't, would be easier to pay off the lawsuits and the insurance than to actually recall over a million Pintos that were on the road, potentially threatening the lives of everybody in those cars. That's murder for profit. Murder for profit. I expect Michael Corleone or Vito Corleone to come after me. I don't expect the Ford Motor Company to have me as like, you know, enemy number one on their list. Uh, this is shocking. Because why? Because it's saying, this film, that it's impossible to actually conduct a business in America in a hugely successful manner without being unethical about it. You have to be unethical to succeed. The film is saying, I'm not saying you want to embrace that, you might want to embrace that, you, you might know that story yourself, but my point is, the greatest filmmakers are always critical on a fundamental level of the worlds that they are portraying. You see, that's what make these, makes these films so special, so powerful, and I know the clock is, is ticking on me. So can I show you one more comparison and contrast? Is that all right? Can we save with the Godfather for one more clip? If you're cool about it, I think you'll like this. Dr. Barsini, I want to thank you for helping me organize this meeting here today. And also the other heads of the five families from New York and New Jersey. Comrade Cooney, I'm from the Bronx. And uh, Brooklyn, <coughs> Philip the <Tatale. coughs> from Staten Island, we have with us uh, Victor Starkey and all the other associates that came as far as from California, Kansas City, and all the other territories of the country. Thank you. Board meeting. All corporations have them. This corporation of crime has them. But you see, what you want to do, and what Michael claims he wants to do, is that he wants to actually become legitimate. He wants to actually go straight. He wants to be a, a real corporation. And this is where he finds himself. Most respected gentlemen, muy respetados caballeros, allow me to welcome Mr. William Shaw, Senor William Shaw, presenting the same scene, same identical scene. General Food Company, representando the General Food Company. Messrs. Congo and Dan, Senores Congo and Dan, United Telephone and Telegraph Company, the United Telephone and Telegraph Company. Mr. Petty, Senor Petty, Regional Vice President of the Pan American Mining Corporation. Regional Pan American Mining Corporation. Mr. Robert Allen of South American Sugar. Senor Robert Allen of South American Sugar. And Mr. Michael Corleone of Nevada. And Senor Michael Corleone of Nevada. Representing our associates in tourism and leisure activities. Well, that is a another name for it. Tourism and leisure activities. Murder, kickbacks, prostitution, drug pedal, right. Leisure, tourism. And my old friend and associate from Florida, Mr. Hyman Rhodes. I would like to take this opportunity to thank United Telephone and Telegraph for their lovely Christmas gift. Telephone and Telegraph Company. Solid Gold Telephone. Es un teléfono de oro macizo. Perhaps you gentlemen would like to take a look at it. Quizás, caballeros, ustedes quisieran verlo. Mr. President. Yes. Perhaps you would discuss the status of rebel activity and uh, what this can mean to our businesses. Of course. Of course. Machero. <laughs> in a town. But you see, um, that gift to the Solid Gold Telephone, <laughs> there is another name for it. Um, uh, a bribe, a bribe, <laughs> right? Of course. And see, people look at this movie and go, oh, wow, look at Mike, he's really come a long way. He's now sitting at the table with, not gangsters, real legitimate businessmen. Well, that's one way of looking at it. But I think the way that Francis Ford Coppola wants you to look at it is now Michael, trying to become legitimate, finds himself, when he pursues that route, amongst the biggest gangsters the world has ever known.
South American Sugar, General Food Company, you know, AT&T, right, Bell Atlantic, whatever. These guys are the biggest mafias there are. And how did U.S. Steel become U.S. Steel? United Steel, right? They became so successful because they were just so fair and so honest in the way they so played by those same rules with everybody else. No, the way U.S. Steel became number one in America is because it crushed anybody that came in its path. You were dead unless you became united with them. You see? What a scene. And they're worried about how it's all going to affect you. It's all about business. That's what it's about. And you really think it all comes down to the money. You see, everything that's going on in America right now, if they trace the money, they have to trace the money, that's where the answers will come out. That's where the truth will come out. So, I know you've had enough of the Godfather. So, I'm going to give you have, have a little comedy. Right? You've earned it. The Graduate. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again Because a vision softly creeping Left its seeds while I was sleeping okay, Mike Nichols, his real name was Mikhail Igor Pechikovsky. He came from Germany to escape the Nazis in about, well, he was born in 1931, in the late 30s, to America. Couldn't even speak English. He only could say two things in English. Thank you very much was the first. Please don't kiss me was the second thing he could say. He would actually go on to become a stage performer with Elaine May, Nichols and May. They did like vaudeville, like sketch comedy, song and dance routines. They were very funny. Transitions in his 20s to become a major theatrical director of stage plays, plays in America. The Graduate, I, I have so much to say about this film, but I mean, I, I see my clock is, you know, ticking down, and I want to get to one other movie after this one. So, he has a graduation party, Benjamin Braddock. You know, he's home from college, and they have some very penetrating <laughs> questions. Oh, Dan! We're all so proud. Proud, 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 proud. What are you going to do now? I was going to go upstairs for a minute. Oh, but I meant with your future. Your life. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Okay, now, he just told me I have 10 more minutes, so thank you very much, Robert. Now, okay, you guys are beautiful, as they say in LA. I want you to notice this is a CinemaScope screen, 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. All right, The Godfather, the way they were able to shoot those interiors, where it was really dark, but like you could see the contrast of the black chair with his dark brown suit in a very dimly lit sepulchre-like office is because they actually invented Chemtone film in the mid-1970s, and these directors immediately seized upon the technology. Well, of course, the CinemaScope had been around for a while, but here's a director, Mike Nichols, who's going to actually use the technology to his advantage. CinemaScope was designed for Ben-Hur, big epics, like How the West Was Won. It wasn't designed for an intimate story like this. It's designed for all the horses to be seen, not just a few in the 1.33, but you couldn't have Ben-Hur in the 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio of Charlton Heston. William Wilder film, 1959. But see, with this, he's actually going to use something that's used for epics, and he's going to pull the camera right up close, intimate, almost theatrical, right? The intimacy. You can take a Q-tip and clean that ear out if you want to, <laughs> right? So there already, I feel, a sense of claustrophobia. Everybody's closing in on him with advice. What are you going to do with your life? It's kind of a hard question when you're 22, you just got out of college. I mean, he doesn't know yet. He knows one thing, though. At least he thinks he doesn't want to be his parents. That's number one. In America in the late 1960s, through the 70s, probably into the 80s, but he doesn't want to be his parents. They're shallow, right? Their friends are shallow. Their parties are, are boring. And so he wants to find himself. And yet, it's kind of hard to break out. This whole film seems to be enclosing, entombing, Dustin Hoffman, Benjamin Braddock, in glass. Whether it's he's in his room and he's being shot through the actual aquarium that it looks like he's inside, trapped inside the aquarium, or what you see right here. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, John. Glass. 
sliding glass doors. There's going to be the glass of his windshield of his car. There's going to be the glass of the bus at the end. There's the glass in the church from the balcony. What is he trying to say here, Mikhail Igor Petrikovsky? I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. May I ask him? Yes, sir. Plastics. <laughs> exactly how do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. What do you think about it? Yes, sir. I'm set. That's a deal. <laughs> I'll drink to that, right? <laughs> Everything's plastic. Bottle of water, this computer, this podium, those white fillings in your teeth, that shower curtain that he actually pulled down in, uh, you know, uh, high anxiety, Mel Brooks. Anybody have a new car here? Anybody? You get into that car, the first thing you do when it's a new car, you go, I just love that new car smell. <laughs> right? But guess what? Those are the phthalates. That's the plastic off-gassing from the dashboard. It's really not healthy. It's gonna, end up, they're endocrine disruptors. It's putting estrogen, too much of it, into all of our systems. It's killing us. And guess what? You gotta roll those windows down. You gotta drive maybe in the cold. Maybe it doesn't get cold enough here. It doesn't matter. Get that smell out of the car. But no, people embrace that smell. And even when it's gone, I'm sure there's still some of it lurking somewhere because that is still going to be off-gassing that entire plastic cockpit in that car. It's all toxic in a way. Everything is plastic, from the floors to everything. They look like they're wood, but they're not. Well, was Mike Pickle saying that everything is going to be plastic in the future? Well, if so, this is the most proleptic, the, most, the greatest foreshadowing of the future probably in the history of cinema. But what he's talking about is ultimately the plastic relationship. Right? The in inauthentic right? way that we actually communicate to and deal with one another. That's something that's terrifying to a young person who sees the dissatisfaction of his mother and father's generation. So much so that Mrs. Robinson targets him and tries to have an affair with him. And does. Until a younger virgin, I mean version of herself, <laughs> comes into the movie in the form of her daughter, her own daughter, Catherine Ross. Now, what is funny... Oh, Jesus, God. No. said Mrs. Robinson. Now what's happened here? There's a lot to say. Number one, if you can keep that picture up. First of all, he dumped her for her daughter. It's kind of tough, you know, being a woman and your sexual rival is your own daughter. And because she doesn't want Benjamin to have a relationship with her, she says, Benjamin, I don't want you to have a relationship with her, a sexual relationship with her. And he's like, you don't think I'm good enough for her, do you? Instead of understanding He's like so immature, he's so stupid, right? He's not the smartest knife in the drawer. He's only 22. I understand, we gotta cut him some slack. But still, he takes it as if you don't think I'm good enough for her. And she says, that's not it, Benjamin. No, it's something else, but he doesn't get it. So she actually rushes her daughter to marry what we would call in America the quintessential wasp prince, right? And she's too young to be married. Let's just face it, she's not even finished college. She probably hardly even knows this guy. He's just a friend of the family. Seems like the right, you know, type of catch to have. Perfect type of husband. You know, he comes from a good family. Good family, whatever that means. And this way he won't be able to get to it. So Benjamin knows he's got to stop this wedding. And so he gets his, in his car and he drives. But he forgot to put gas in the tank. Because again, he's not really forward thinking. <laughs> Gases, gas, cars need gas to run. So he runs out of gas. He's on foot. So he gets to the church. Not in time. Every other crappy movie, okay movie, whatever, has a scene on TV, whether it's in Spanish, Italian, it could be in Korean. There's somebody that's marrying somebody who's not the right person for that person. And our guy is headed to the church. And he gets there just at the moment when the 
priest or reverend, whoever it is, says something along these lines. If anyone out there feels that these two should not be joined together forever in the bonds of Harriet and matrimony, it's usually some British actor who's flown in just for the production for three days in between shows on stage in the West End of London. Right? The whole time he's there on set, he's drunk. He's getting into fights with the crew. He's actually hitting on the script girl or script boy, depending on his sexual orientation. But anyway, when he's on, on camera, he chews it up. Then they put him on a plane. He sobers up. He goes back to London, goes to Stratford upon Avon, and he's prancing around stage, adjusting his cape as King Lear. You know, am I a man more sinned against than sinning? But right now, he's being paid twice, three times, five times, which he's going to get for the whole run of, you know, King Lear at Stratford upon Avon. And he says, <laughs> and he says these two should not be joined together forever in the bonds of holy matrimony. Oh, let him speak now! Oh, forever hold his peace. And that's when the door opens. The door opens right then. And that's when our guy says, Mona, you can't marry that loser. You gotta marry this loser. And she, right, runs, and they get together and go, thank God, he saved her from becoming an Ibsen-esque Henrik Ibsen, right? Henrik Ibsen, a doll's house, thank you, Nora, the slamming of the door, saved her from becoming an Ibsen-esque doll. But the genius of Mike Nichols is that he makes him late, and she's already married to the guy. So how the hell is this gonna play out? Everybody is wondering. It's 1967. A lot's going on in 1967 in America, and that's a lot's going to happen between 1967 and 1969. That's going to be 1968. That's brewing. All those assassinations. The war is going to take a terrible turn in Vietnam for Americans. And we are right here. We're on one side. We have the graduate with his frank portrayal of sex. On the other hand, we have Bonnie and Clyde with violence like audiences have never seen depicted that way before. They put a pincer attack on Jack Valenti, the president of the Motion Picture Association of America, and he is forced to actually declaw the Catholic Legion of Decency and the Hayes Office, which exerted control over the way movies would look from about 1935 to 1968. These movies pushed the envelope so far, he had to come up with a whole new rating system. Rated X. Right, which would later be appropriated, right, stolen, purloined by the porno industry, was originally a rating that actually Midnight Cowboy is the only movie ever to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, starring Dustin Hoffman and John Voight, 1969, directed by Schlesinger, John Schlesinger. It won Best Picture, rated X. But here we are, right? And we're wondering how this is going to turn out. I already said that Benjamin's not too bright. I'm getting to be a little worried about her, too. Those eyes, there's something vacant in those eyes. She's beautiful. There's no doubt she's beautiful. She was beautiful in 1967. She's beautiful now. She's timeless in her beauty. But she's not ready for any of this. She's not ready for the man that you're going to see that she's just gotten married to. But she's also not ready for Benjamin. But Benjamin's sole motivation is literally, you can't have her. Then I got to have her! You see, that shows you how young he is. That's not a way to build a relationship that will last. <laughs> it also reminds me of another movie that looked, same actress, same kind of wife she might become. Stepford Wise. I want to shoot that clock. <laughs> <laughs> And the irony is the one on the right has a more knowing expression than she does, and she's already been turned into a robot. What does that tell you? All right. <laughs> Did I say more about a wasp prince? Wow. Hey, it's too late, not for me! Yeah. 
Are there any Catholics in the house? <laughs> I'm Catholic. We love this moment. We'll be excommunicated someday. You know, we'll, we'll probably have to answer for this. You know, at the pearly gates. But we love this moment. <laughs> and America was under 18. The baby boom was coming into its own. It was the first film that spoke to them. They loved this movie. It was their manifesto. <laughs> Years of joy. People are giving each other five. They can't high five. It hasn't been invented yet in 1967. But they're going crazy. The whole building is shaking. I was there. I was seven years old. I snuck into the Buckingham Theater in Northern Virginia, Arlington, Virginia, outside of DC, my hometown. I know you don't want to admit that you come from that place. But anyway, um, here we are. And you know what? They kind of missed the moment. They were so busy celebrating. They didn't realize that actually Mike Nichols now has turned the film against them. Because who is she and who is he? Well, to each other, they don't really know each other. It's kind of tough to be 22 and 20, and the most exciting thing that can ever happen in your life has just occurred. It's all downhill for the rest of your life. From here. <laughs> and you know what? Well, if Mike Nichols had gone from them looking like this, in sync, happy, and then cut to that bus driving away, we'd go, oh man, this is going to be a happy future. But guess what? That Dan Mikhail Igor Petchikovsky with that dark German sensibility, <laughs> right? That Teutonic sensibility. He's going to drain all the life out of this extremely happy moment. The song that comes up that was drowned out by that audience initially in 1967 is totally antithetical to the mood. In fact, he says nothing to her. She says nothing to him. They can only promise each other silence. And guess what? They're not going to be in sync. He's going to be smiling when she's not. She's going to be looking like she's picking lint off herself. She seems scared when he seems happy. When he, but it is over. He just wanted her because he couldn't have her. Now he's got her, and guess what? She's not really dressed appropriately for this journey. His jacket is ripped. He probably put the last bit of money he has in his pocket on this bus to nowhere. I don't know, somewhere. Some uncertain future, but I'll tell you this. Eventually, there's going to be a question that's going to come up. Because, you know, he is a guy who's going to have sex with a beautiful virgin bride on her wedding night, and he's not her husband. If that's not the ultimate late 1960s male fantasy, what is? But once you get that over with, it gets kind of old. And she's going to say something like, Oh, Benjamin, by the way, there's something that's been on my mind for quite a while. What is it, dear? Am I as um, good as mom was? How do you answer the question, that question, guys? Very carefully. Well, your mother was great. But no, but I mean, but you, you, man, you. She's going to target some guy down the line, and she's going to become her mother. She is her mother in the future. We all become what we rebel. That's what Rebel Without a Cause is all about. Why is it called Rebel Without a Cause? Because James Dean becomes what he rebels against. He becomes his dad at the end of that movie. If I'm ever invited back, we'll do Rebel Without a Cause. That movie will blow your mind. Nicholas Ray, 1955. But for right now, take it away, Mike Nichols. Right? Right. Right. What a great moment. Young Emilio Estevez has a whole new way of looking at his part. And you see, why is he so mad? Well, partly it is because ultimately it surprises. He is a decent guy. But also, while this stupid jerk landlord is wasting their time trying to evict people like that, they're not doing anybody any harm, they're working their asses off, they could be needed somewhere in this city right now with someone who has a serious emergency on their hands. And you see, that also enrages them. But that performance, I saw this movie when I was 12 years old. I saw it with my dad. I never forgot that scene. I showed it to my students today. And they're moved by it. 
And it's an issue that has not changed in all these years, right? Because America exploits anybody who is at the social, you know, bottom that comes into this country, our country, or actually just doesn't have the educational skills or whatever. They really, really take advantage. They don't give them any health care, don't give them anything. They take everything. And so what do they resort to a lot of times? Criminality. We got the Godfather on our hands. So anyway, I just want to really thank Sophia. I want to thank Andre, Alec, uh, uh, John Carlos, Lot, Ronaldo. I'm probably forgetting somebody. They are amazing. They are like superheroes to me because they got all this to work. They should be wearing capes. It's the only thing missing. But you've been a great audience. And if you have any questions, I'll answer a couple questions. But I will let you go. Thank you. Thank you.